from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Welcome to Face the State, everyone. I'm Andy Curtis, and thanks for joining us. The wildlife we have here in Montana is one of our state's greatest natural resources. It's a resource that every year brings in millions and millions of dollars through both hunting and wildlife tourism. But sadly, it's also a resource that is currently under attack by an almost invisible threat. And that threat, if not taken seriously by us right now, could cause some problems further down the road. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll be talking with the experts on the front lines of fighting this disease here in Montana. A word of warning though, we'll also be discussing hunting and game management with images of animals in various stages of field dress and being processed. For most of the time, the animal is infected and out there spreading it among his or her peers in, in the herd there looks totally healthy to us. We wouldn't know the difference. And like I say, it's only in the last oh, month or so that it starts to show those clinical signs and then eventually dies. Chronic wasting disease, otherwise known as CWD, is a neurological disease that attacks the brains, spinal cords, and nervous systems of cervids like elk, deer, moose, and caribou. It's always fatal, spreads easily, and as of right now, there is no cure. It's a member of a group of diseases called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, also known as TSEs, and they more than live up to their name. Basically, the brain looks like a sponge would, where a lot of vacuoles occur, and this, those vacuoles are from changes that occur following the infection. Brent Race is a staff scientist at Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Hamilton, where some of the most contagious and terrifying diseases known to man, like the Ebola virus, are studied. That makes this highly secure facility the perfect home for CWD research, which Brent has been on the forefront of for the past 13 years basically leads to a decline in cognitive ability where the animal loses neurons and if you lose neurons you're not able to function correctly you lose ability to escape predators you don't remember to eat and drink and you essentially have a slow decline where you will lose weight and eventually succumb to the disease and it's a disease that's fundamentally different than most nobody knows that better than disease ecologist for montana fish wildlife and parks emily almberg who handle samples of CWD positive animals on a regular basis in Bozeman. It's caused by a misfolded protein. It's, a, it's called a prion. We have normal healthy prions throughout our body. Uh, most all mammals do. And um, this misfolded form, when it comes in contact with the healthy form, causes them to misfold and then they malfunction. And pretty soon you get an accumulation of these misfolded proteins that don't work and you get tissue death and eventual animal death. People are familiar with germs, which they think of as bacteria or viruses. Well, prions are not a bacteria, they're not a virus. They're kind of a class of their own, being an infectious protein. They're part of living things, but they're, they in themselves are not a living entity. That little fact doesn't keep the disease from spreading easily through a very social species like deer and elk. Fairly well accepted that CWD is spread likely by oral exposure and whether that's from contact with other deer via saliva or other excretions, or whether that's from exposure to a contaminated environmental things such as grass or what they're consuming. Uh, definitely oral exposures appear to be very prominent. Uh, intranasal exposure is likely possible as well. So from a deer, an infected deer sheds the, the prions with saliva, urine, feces? Sure, and even carcasses when they eventually succumb to the disease, you've got a carcass that contaminates certainly some of the environment around that. So you've got kind of a um, disaster in the making when you've got an animal that's infected for up to two years and many of the time is spent shedding the prions into the environment. So once the animal is infected, it acts as sort of a ticking time bomb, spreading the disease wherever it goes, even after it's dead. So the one thing we know about CWD is that it's really slow moving. Mm -hmm. It takes decades to, to climb to prevalences where you know, we start seeing population impacts. But at that point, we start to worry about increased rates of transmission, a larger environmental reservoir of these prions that could cause transmission. Um, and all the evidence suggests that if we tackle this early and we try and keep prevalence low, that we stand the best chance of managing the disease. Um, we don't want prevalence to climb above 5% 
you know, up to the 10, 15 percent, because once we get there, the rate of epidemic growth just dramatically increases, uh, and we do see population level impacts. So for example, the, the best evidence to date comes from Colorado and Wyoming, where they've studied mule deer herds and white-tailed deer herds. And you know, in, in Wyoming, for example, they've, they've got a herd that they've documented you know, on average 20% declines annually in a, in a pretty heavily infected herd. Um, and that's, pretty, that's a pretty frightening <laughs> statistic. Uh, similarly, in Colorado, they've, declined, they've, they've documented a, um, like a 45% decline in their mule deer herds over a 20 year period. And they think a lot of that's attributable to CWD in, in particular areas. Um, so it's, the jury's out whether at that point it'll be easy to turn it back, turn the tide back. Um, we're trying, you know, those states are trying, but, um, but we think if we can try and manage it now at low levels, we'll, we'll stand the best chance of keeping it under control. In some places, when, when prevalence gets up to 20, 30, 40 percent of the animals, then we can start to see some population effects. And we know, for instance, in other states where populations have declined by 45 percent, or in some cases 20 percent per year kind of thing. So it can be very serious and we're taking it very serious here at Fish, Wildlife and Parks. So mortality in deer and elk comes from a lot of different things, whether it's hunting pressure, whether it's predation, whether it's natural elements, whether it's poor fawn recruitment rates in some cases, mm -hmm. certainly survival, survival of wildlife. It, it's a feat for them to actually live through the first year. But when you start to add an infectious disease to the landscape like CWD that's capable of killing 10 to 20 percent of the population per year in areas where it's really heavily infected, that's an additional level of loss that populations often aren't able to um, accept. And so then if you had an excess amount of an animals in an area, now you no longer have an excess. Maybe you don't have animals available to the public. Maybe you don't have animals available for public hunting. Maybe you don't even have animals available for public viewing in a worst case scenario. So certainly chronic wasting disease in some habitats will affect overall game populations. An infected deer or elk could already be facing a death sentence and never show the signs which can be a real problem for those at FWP, like Game Management Bureau Chief John Vory in Helena, who is focused on spreading information on the disease. CWD is not something like a, a harsh winter where all of a sudden a lot of deer die, or something like um, blue tongue or EHD outbreak where people are seeing a lot of deer dead on the landscape. CWD is more insidious and more creeping in, in that way. It takes it takes a long time, sometimes decades, two to three decades before, if left unmanaged, prevalence could get high enough that we would see any population impacts. I mean, it took 30 years or so in Wyoming and Colorado for them to see population impacts. We don't want to get to that point. And so we are doing the management that we are doing now to avoid getting there. We need to keep the public apprised of that and keep them informed of that all along. Leaving the disease go unchecked could not only have consequences for the deer and elk populations, but the economies built around those animals. According to Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, elk, deer and antelope hunters spent around $324 million in Montana in 2016, supporting more than 3,000 jobs. In the study of the impacts of CWD on the hunting community, published in the Human Dimensions of Wildlife Journal, it was estimated that Wisconsin saw a 9.9% decline in hunter expenditures from 2001 to 2002, adding up to an estimated $55 million lost because of the disease. Right now, there is no indication of a decline in hunting related to the disease here in Montana, but those numbers could be a glimpse into the future if chronic wasting disease takes hold. That's a future that could cause some issues for people like Montana Outfitters and Guides Association Executive Director Mac Menard, but a challenge that the organization is up for. Uh, you know, this is a complex disease and, and the responses to it are frankly uh, somewhat untested. I mean, we're, we're plowing new ground here at times and it may be the best business practices or best practices at the time, but we may see other things coming. But is the loss of hunting opportunities and hunting dollars the worst problem that could come from CWD? With millions of people eating wild game all over the country, 
Is there a real danger of this prion disease making its way into humans? I'd never say that it's zero, but it seems like there's a very strong species barrier. Okay. And what we really don't know is, will every strain of chronic waste disease react the same when it is encounters a new species that it could infect? And so that's what our weaknesses are from the research standpoint, is we're testing the most common strains that we can and the, against the most common scenarios of human prion genes. So, but can we cover all of them? Probably not. And will CWD likely continue to change some? It could. Tests that allegedly supported that nightmare scenario where the disease had jumped the species barrier were presented in 2017 by German and Canadian scientists showing that macaque monkeys who were genetically close to humans contracted the disease from CWD positive meat. But those tests have never been peer reviewed or published, an important step in the scientific process. And the CWD positive results have not been replicated. Essentially two different groups have worked with cinemologous macaque monkeys as a model for human transmission of CWD and we started our studies at Rocky Mountain Laboratories in 2003. They were completed in 2016 and we were unable to transmit chronic wasting disease to cinemologous macaques. Um, we had some monkeys on study for over 13 years. None of them developed clinical signs and none of them appeared to amplify chronic wasting disease in their brains. And we used very sensitive diagnostic tests and saw no evidence of transmission. Brent and the scientists at Rocky Mountain Labs didn't stop there, conducting a wide range of experiments with similar results. Um, one model that we've spent a lot of time here studying has been actually a mouse designed to have human prion proteins. And by putting human prion proteins, engineering them into a mouse, those mice are now susceptible to human prion diseases. Mm -hmm. And so they're a great model for susceptibility tests like this. And ourselves and actually now five other laboratories have done studies making these engineered mice that have human prion protein and tried to get chronic wasting disease to infect them. None of those studies have shown transmission to the transgenic mice with human prion protein. So those studies really heavily suggest a strong species barrier between deer CWD and human infection. Luckily, so far, there is a lot of evidence that the disease can't cross over into humans. But it's still a possibility that the CDC is keeping an eye on. The Centers of Disease Control and the Prion Disease Surveillance Center at Case Western University do keep an eye on human prion disease. And by keep an eye on it, I mean like they're registering people who have knowingly consumed chronic wasting disease. They're also watching the populations in areas that have high levels of CWD, like Wyoming, Colorado, and Wisconsin. Specifically, they're looking for an increase in prion diseases in human population compared to humans that aren't consuming CWD. And they're also watching for things like an increase in prion disease in humans that are young, say 20 or 30 or 40 years old. This would be abnormal for humans to contract prion disease at those ages. And so if they see an uptick in young humans getting prion diseases, and those happen to overlap with humans living in areas and consuming infected cervids, that would be a huge red flag that maybe we've got a breach of the transmission barrier and that humans are getting chronic wasting disease. Fortunately, to date, they have not reported any such increases. Even still, the CDC and FWP both recommend not eating meat from known infected animals. That's because honestly, at this point in time, too little is still known about the disease to make sure that it's 100% safe. And because it's happened before. A good example of a similar TSE is mad cow disease. But on the plus side, mad cow does give a little bit of insight into what the spread of a prion disease linked to infected meat might look like. We've had chronic wasting disease around now for longer than mad cow disease was in Great Britain. So the difference might be the number of exposures we're seeing are still low compared to Great Britain where they had several million BSC infected cattle enter the food chain. We're not at that point in North America where several million CWD infected cervids have been consumed. So it's not a fair comparison yet. But if you look at the timing, we definitely have had enough, a lot of time since the 80s and 90s where Colorado and Wyoming were likely having consumption of CWD infected cervids. We're out now to almost 2020. That's a long time, even probably long enough for a prion disease to show itself. And we're not seeing an increase in humans infected with prion disease in Colorado and Wyoming. So that's encouraging, but the numbers may just not be high enough right. if the transmission rate's low. 
And there's another prion disease known in humans called Kuru that could help scientists understand a potential end to chronic wasting disease. But uh, this one isn't exactly spread through cows. These folks were very susceptible to it and they passed it by cannibalism. Well, they happen to all be a certain at what we call position 129, which is just a numbering scheme for the amino acids. They were all the same and they were very susceptible. Somewhere along the lines, there was a mutation at a nearby amino acid at position 127 that couldn't get Kuru. And so that mutation in the prion allowed them not to get sick. And so those people survived and started to basically populate so because they lived. Just evolution. Just yeah. evolution. And wow. so the same evolution could actually work with the deer and elk populations too. We just haven't really identified an ideal substitution that protects them from chronic wasting disease. But we know the same thing occurred with sheep scrapie. We know there's sheep out there that are resistant to scrapie. Mm -hmm. And so with time, there will likely be deer and elk that are resistant to chronic wasting disease. It's going to take decades, if not hundreds of years, for them to be able to populate. So with CWD confirmed on the landscape in northern Montana, along the state's southern border, and most recently near Libby, what can be done to stop it from spreading? At least one answer is already out in the field and more than willing to put in the work. Hunters are the solution here because, you know, we're, we're not going to go out and start, we, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we're not going to go out and start eliminating deer on the landscape. Hunters are the tool that we use to manage CWD. And so, again, I'm going to come back to the communication part. Hunters can become informed as to what, this, what, the, what the disease is, how it's spread, and the potential impacts that it can have in the future and then do everything that we've outlined as far as uh, adhere to those regulations that we've put in place. For example, we have these um, CWD management zones that we've instituted around areas where we know we have CWD on the landscape. So things like not transporting whole carcasses or the brain or spinal column of animals outside of those CWD management zones. We want to keep the disease there. We don't want it spread to other places. And so hunters, we need to have hunters adhere to those, those uh, travel restrictions, if you will, in those CWD management zones. Now that's important because even though it's spread by the animals licking and moving around with one another, the human transportation of infected carcasses appears to be expanding CWD's reach. USGS was able to work with the state of Wisconsin and what they did is they found out the zip codes from all the hunters that successfully harvested a deer taken in one, any of four different counties in Wisconsin known to have high levels of chronic wasting disease. And what they found of all those animals that were shot in Wisconsin over a two year period, the red dots on this map indicate where those hunters zip, home zip codes or originated from and so you can see that this could potentially lead to a disaster very fast if you were transporting CWD infected carcasses from Wisconsin to all these other locales in the United States you could have rapid spread to many new areas and so it's extremely important that when you're hunting in areas no one have chronic wasting disease you keep the highly infectious parts in those locations and you don't move them across state lines to new areas. We're encouraging people to dispose of, if they take a carcass out, uh, out of the field, you know, dispose of all the trimmings and the waste in a landfill before they, um, they leave the zone. And that just, again, is, is sort of common sense and mm -hmm. reduces the risk of transmission. Don't go dumping it. Yeah, don't go dumping it. And that's a big message we're trying to get out this year. Just try, it, that's a, I think a, a cultural habit in, among some families and people that just, you know, they, they think it's, and it, and it makes sense, right? I mean, you could be putting out a carcass and at least scavengers are cleaning it up. But, you know, with CWD on the landscape, it's probably not the best idea. We really would encourage people to take it to a landfill, dispose of it properly. That also goes for taking your animal to a processor or taxidermist. If shot in a CWD positive area, they need to stay in that CWD positive area. Because as an infected carcass breaks down, it continues to shed those prions that can be picked up by anything that might encounter it, and even the soil itself. Well, it makes it a fairly, fairly unique in the you know world of infectious organisms or infectious material. Um, it stays around um, for 
you know, for CWD, the proof of concept is that it remains infection, infectious after two years, but probably longer than that if it remains um, near the soil surface and available for, you know, accidental consumption or um, contact with a live animal. Yeah, so I, I guess that's the best evidence we have. And we know scrapie can cont has contaminated a like a paddock uh, a pen mm -hmm. and has remained infectious after 16 years. So it's possible it's there for a long time. Um, and I think the, our emphasis is managing early and trying to keep prevalence low because as prevalence builds, so does that environmental reservoir of prions. And you know, more and more transmission might happen through that environmental route, which gets really difficult to control. They certainly know that prions that are secreted in the environment can bind to soils. Mm -hmm. And that, at least with sheep scrapie, which is a similar prion disease, they know at least 16 years those have been viable in the environment. For chronic wasting disease, the studies aren't out that long, but it looks like they're very viable for many years, um, likely on the soil, but short term on vegetation as well until they get down to the soil. So sadly, once it's in an area, it's there for a long time. That makes early detection and surveillance when numbers are considered manageable, crucial. A strategic sort of statewide surveillance plan that allows us to rotate around the state um, and look for it pretty intensively so that when we walk away we can say with some confidence that it's absent or below some threshold. Um, so that's, that's part of it. Then the next step is once we find it, we try and figure out exactly what the prevalence is and the distribution and then develop a herd specific management plan. And the tools that we have at our disposal include things like reducing buck doe ratios. So bucks are two to three times more likely than does for mule deer um, to have the disease. And so trying to keep that segment of the population lower seems to be important for managing, uh, managing transmission. Um, general population reduction may help, um, or hot spot removal. So areas where we know that there's a lot of infection, trying to really hit that hard with hunter harvest to keep that um, infected population down so that they don't spread um, the disease. And then the last tool, which we you know, we haven't implemented very widely yet, but I think would be a really important one long term is finding ways to reduce the number of artificial food sources or sort of ag, um, you know, point sources that allow deer to come in. So things like uh, salt blocks or unfenced haystacks that are big attractants for deer, local deer or elk, um, other point sources like that where we know deer could come in in high numbers and be in very close contact, which would facilitate disease transmission. And all this is only possible with hunter assistance. Anyone who collects something out, even outside of our priority areas can take the sample themselves and then ship it to us here at the lab and we will send it out to the testing um, lab at Colorado State University and report back to the hunter. And so this is a change because we'll be covering that cost and you know, accepting samples from pretty much anywhere. The key again is that we're asking hunters to collect the sample themselves. So we're gonna be beefing up our uh, videos online and, um, and hopefully training opportunities, trying to, to teach hunters how to collect those appropriate samples. These samples are only as good as the hunter data given. So accurate reporting is vital. We're asking people to go on to Hunt Planner and try and find exactly where they hunted and click on that spot. And these plans also help keep an eye on human health. Although we don't have CWD in humans yet, it's important to know where CWD is and where it is not. And so that if humans do start to develop odd prion diseases and have exposure to eating and consuming deer and elk from certain areas, we need to know where those areas were and if in fact they did or didn't have CWD. Um, if you're not testing everywhere and you start to see humans with prion disease that doesn't match known prion diseases, uh, you might get a false sense of security that, oh, maybe that's from something else. So it's important to survey many areas to keep track of where it is and isn't for wildlife management and for human health concerns should it be transmitting to humans. So what does the future hold for management of CWD here in Montana? For starters, FWP has assembled a CWD action team to confront the issue head on and develop new plans and strategies as more is learned about the disease. With its presence confirmed in over 24 states, this is truly a nationwide problem that more is being learned about all the time. Also, as of right now, all CWD samples are sent to Colorado for testing, but that could be changing too. Test itself is, is sort of regulated. Um, 
nationwide, and there are sort of accredited labs that are allowed to do it. And Montana is looking at getting that accreditation. It's in the process of doing that. So we hope to have a test available within state, um, you know, within a year. Uh, it just takes a while to get the equipment set up and staff trained and that accreditation process complete. No matter what new information comes to light about CWD, the most important thing moving forward is going to continue to be communication. Now that it's relatively new in Montana, it's on people's radar. But on down the road, people get laissez-faire about it or get apathetic about it, don't care about it, and then all of a sudden we have these management programs where we're trying to keep buck numbers down or uh, overall population levels down a little bit then we would lose support for it. If we don't have support for disease management, then we won't be able to do disease management. Economic health, wildlife health, and human health, all are reasons to take the spread of CWD seriously. That's because we might not have a choice in the future. I think the important thing to remember is that if we don't do something like that, the disease will do it for us. And it may get to the point where it's irreversible with the disease. So we get to a point where we see very few old-aged animals, bucks and does, um, the population's in decline, and then suddenly we're at a point where we can't really manage the disease or control it anymore. Um, whereas with management, if we hit you know, sort of the male segment pretty hard initially. There might be opportunities in the in the future where we could let up a little bit, and then resume. And so I don't know. It's hard. You know, there been, there's been a lot of discussion about what's worse, the the, the disease or the management of it. Um, I think long term, the management's definitely a better option. Our role as MOGA is to make sure we're an educational conduit, and that we're getting the appropriate material out to folks. Um, you know, this is this is going to be with us forever. It's probably been here much longer than we've known, and um, it, it becomes a, you know, the new normal. It's not a doomsday thing, and we don't want anybody to think it's a doomsday thing, but we're, you know, we're being very uh, prudent in our approach to it, I think, and recognizing that, you know, it's unlikely that even if we were not to do anything in Montana, even if we were not to do any management, it's going to take like I said, 20 or 30 years before we start to see some kind of population impact. I'm not going to see that, but my daughter will and grandkids will. And so we're thinking of, we, we want wildlife to be here. We want deer and elk and moose to be here on the landscape. And so people can enjoy them the way that they are right now with hunting and viewing and all the benefits that wildlife brings to this state. We want that to be in place 20, 30, 50, 100 years on down the road. And to do that, we need to be vigilant about CWD management. Chronic wasting disease is more than likely here to stay, but the range of its destructiveness is up to us. With proper education and due diligence, we can hopefully manage this disease and continue to enjoy all that our state's wildlife has to offer for a long time to come. Think your kids and think your grandkids. If you're a young person, think about your future, you know, of your future of hunting and enjoying Montana's wildlife in 20 or 30 years. If we don't get on top of CWD management and be vigilant about trying to manage for CWD now, it can have some very serious effects in the future. There is a lot more on chronic wasting disease and chronic wasting disease management that I didn't have a chance to touch on in today's story. So if you're interested in learning more, and you should be, Head on over to our website, click on this story, and there you'll find the appropriate links on more information on the disease and how to even properly butcher your CWD positive elk and send in samples to FWP. For MTN News, I'm Andy Curtis. Thanks for watching. You've been watching Face to State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.